Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Um, TSNE Mission Works is so excited to welcome you to this second talk in our grassroots speaker series. This is a series that was created by TSNE Mission Works staff in response to the challenges that many grassroots organizations are facing in terms of funding, visibility, and public awareness around key social justice issues. So the series is meant to highlight the creativity, resourcefulness, and resilience of local community organizers, and to make space for TSNE staff and other um, nonprofit workers to and interested community members to come together and actively listen and engage with grassroots leaders. Um, so we're hopeful that the events in this series will spark uh, conversations around how we can support the important work of these grassroots organizers. Um, so a few housekeeping notes for today. Please help yourself to the food in the back. And the food is from Haley House in Roxbury. Haley House is dedicated to helping those made vulnerable by the harshest effects of inequality move toward wholeness and economic independence. And their transitional employment program seeks to break the cycle of incarceration by supporting people returning home to the community. Bathrooms are located out this door um, down the hallway to the right, and there's also a gender neutral bathroom on the fourth floor. Uh, we're live streaming today's event, and we'll be taking pictures. Um, if you do not wish to be photographed, you can put a red sticker on your name tag. Um, if you have any questions, hold on to them until the end, and we'll do a question and answer session. Um, and we do ask for everyone to wait until we pass you the microphone so that everyone in the room and on the live stream can hear your question. Um, so that brings me to our featured speaker. I have the honor of introducing Douglas Rogers, who I've known and admired for the last six years. He is a formerly incarcerated individual working to destroy the prison industrial system. Douglas was one of the first members of Black and Pink, and he has dedicated himself to being a strong advocate for abolishing solitary confinement. He serves as a member of Black and Pink's leadership circle, and he will be sharing with us insight into how his lived experience shapes his organizing work. Please join me in welcoming Douglas Rogers. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to take a moment of silence for the 17 victims that have lost their life in Florida. Could we take a moment of silence, please? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I am here today to give you a, a glance of my life. Um, I was formerly incarcerated for a number of 15 years in a correctional facility. As, <clears throat> as I was incarcerated, I actually um, became to know a person that is a dear friend of mine. His name is Jason Lydon. Uh, we came up with the idea of black and pink. Um, Jason is a dear friend of mine. Uh, I've been with black and pink for a number of 14 years. The work that we do, we try to help, I help uh, facilitate people that are actually coming home, that are incarcerated, and actually coming to the halfway house for transition back into society. My work surrounds HIV, helping individuals deal with suicide, individuals helping <clears throat> me, helping them to learn how to cope with back into society and get to be a productive member of society. Because each and every one of us, we have done things we're not proud of, we made mistakes. And we ask that, you know, don't look at us as a criminal. Look at us as a person that needs help, needs support, and needs to come back out here in society and be a productive citizen in their community. That's what my goal is, to help individuals. Well, I want to give you a glance of my life while I was incarcerated. Here's one of the pictures uh, during Christmas time that I was away from my family a number of years. This picture is taken at Fort Worth, Texas. I was held there. Um, I actually was there for 
for a number of years. Uh, at that time, I had a hip replacement, um, being that I didn't get the adequate medical attention that I did need. I fell back down to needing more ongoing medical treatment. So these are one of the pictures that I admire because uh, you know I was away from my family during the holiday. Um, this is um, one of the pictures that I was in the medium security in Pennsylvania in Air Mass. And here's some pictures of me and couple of other guys that, you know, they admired me and helped me with my time of incarceration. And the picture on the right is a dear friend of mine. Uh, he was deported back to his country because he was here illegally. And we know with the situation going on now that a lot of people are going to be deported back. And I'm um, against what the government is trying to do with people that been here and that are illegal, as they say, but they're still American citizens, and they're trying to deport them back to their country. And there's one dear friend of mine who was here uh, two weeks ago back to Mexico. Um, <clears throat> here's another picture of guys that I helped. He was in a wheelchair the individual that's sitting in the chair, um, being in uh, Devons, Massachusetts, he wasn't getting the proper medical treatment, and he became uh, sick with sores, bed sores on his body because of lack of medical treatment. And there's another dear friend of mine that was deported back to Columbia uh, a couple of months ago. He got out of the detainer center. He thought he was going to be <clears throat> released, and ICE came and locked him up. So he just got deported, too. Here's uh, happy times with me and my sister. She came to see me in Fort Worth, Texas. I was down there for like three years, never had a visit. So these are these happy moments that I did have with my family, but they had to travel and spend money to come visit. My mom, me and my mom, haven't seen her in five years, so that was a happy time for me to be able to touch m my mom. My dad, it was good to see him. And that is a picture of my grandmother, who I loved and dearly missed six months prior before I came home, she passed away. Um, you know, that leads me back to the work that I do for Black and Pink because I have dedicated my life for the struggle of people that are behind these walls that doesn't have family members. They need all the support that anyone can give. You know, we, we have a campaign for Pen Pal. I'm asking each and every one of you if you could pick up one of the flyers in the back. They're located on the table if you would like to write anybody. You know, we have a drop-in center on Sundays. We have it at um, the Boston office by B, B5, right? Yeah, the yeah, the locations are on the flyer. But um, I touch back to why this campaign means so much to me. I was placed in solitary confinement, which is called the shoe for an assault by an officer. I brought these allegations to the Bureau of Prison, to the warden. At this time, when I did actually bring that to the forefront of being mistreated by a, by a correctional officer, I was placed in solitary confinement. I was placed in solitary confinement for a number of six months while they did an investigation. They released me after the six months back out into general population around the same officer. So after that period of time, I followed grievances with the Bureau of Prison about the mistreatment 
that I received from the officer. Word spread around the institution, and I was back in segregation for non-compliant with a strip search. So I was transferred back into the shoe, which is the hole, which is a 23-hour lockdown. You have one hour of recreation. After a period of two, two days, you'll get your first shower. Being that that's a necessity for anybody to have a proper shower, I was denied a proper shower. I was denied proper medical treatment. I was denied my mail. Certain letters wouldn't come to me that my family wrote to me. I wouldn't receive mail for like two months. Never seen a letter. So um, while I was in, in the cell, the officers would come by and you know, you have to ask them for everything that you do need. You have to ask them for a shower. You don't get a phone call. You get a phone call every 30 days. So you're waiting for your mail. You're waiting for certain things, necessities, why you're in locked, locked up <clears throat> in solitary confinement. I was denied those things. I was denied a pencil to write. I was denied a piece of paper. I was denied a, a razor, a simple razor. So I started filing grievances against the officers. Well, I had one of the warden, assistant warden came down. He says, uh, you know, we got to get rid of you because you're, you're a troublemaker. So I said, oh, you label me as a troublemaker. He said, yeah, you're going to going to cause a lot of problems here, so we got to get rid of you. I said, what do you mean you're going to get rid of me? He says, yeah, we're going we're gonna to move you. So I was 3 o'clock in the morning, came knocking on my cell. I said, cuff up. I said, cuff up. It's 3 o'clock in the morning, you know, just waking you right up, lights on, you could be a backup, put your hands behind your back and they cuff you up. So then I was shackled. So like, where am I going? He says, well, we're going to take you down R&D, and you'll find out where you're going after that. So now I had this stigma of label on, on my back and then on my front that I'm a troublemaker because I filed grievances against an officer that assaulted me. So <clears throat> why well, was an R&D? You know, they came, a couple of officers, I'm shackled, handcuffed, don't get placed in a van. Next thing you know, we ended up at a couple of hours in the van. I ended up at an airstrip in upstate New York. Me and three other guys, we were led on to a plane. We asked them, where, where are you taking us? They said, you'll find out when you get there. Next thing you know, we're up in the air. Three hours into the plane ride, we ended up in Lexington, Kentucky. I ain't never been in Lexington, Kentucky in my life. I couldn't tell you anything too much about it, but it was an adventure. So we got to the compound, <clears throat> the prison, another prison in Lexington, Kentucky. So actually, we went downstairs, they took the shackles and handcuffs off, and said, oh, this one, this one, this one, that's how they call you, or they call you by your number. So he said, the gentleman, he, uh, the security, I mean, the guard said to me, he says, uh, well, you stand there. We got a place for you. I said, what do you mean? Wait? You're going back to the shoe. I said, back to the shoe? He said, yeah, you're going back to the hole. So I didn't have none of my property, no pencil, no nothing. Been placed back in segregation, solitary confinement, as it's called. So now, a day goes by. The morning time comes. They bring, God knocks on the door. He says, it's breakfast. Opens the shoe, gives you a, you know, a cold meal. Milk. 
cereal and bread shut the trap. So I asked him, I said, uh, when am I getting out of here? He said, oh, they'll be down to talk to you later on. So I said, what about a shower? Haven't had a shower in three days. He says, well, we'll get to you this afternoon. Everything will happen this afternoon. So now, remind you, we've just been on a plane ride. Had shackles and handcuffs on us. Now, about an hour later, Mr. Rogers, come to the door. Comes to the door. The lieutenant. He says, well, I hate to inform you, but you're going to be here for a little while. I said, what do you mean a little while? He said, well, you're permanently, you're going to be held in segregation for up to 90 days. I said, wait a minute. He said, yeah, we're still doing an investigation. So you mean to tell me I stayed in the hole six months? Another 90 days, so almost a half of a year, almost a year, being held in segregation. So, two weeks go by, nobody, no lieutenant, no warden, no assistant, nobody comes by. So the guard, one of the guards came, he says, well, I got to tell you something, Mr. Rogers. He said, they want to keep you in here for a little while. I said, what do you mean, keep me in here for a little while? I've been in SEG for nine months already. You can get on nine months. He says, well, you got a bad track record following you from the last institution you was at. They called you a troublemaker. He said, you know what they do with troublemakers, don't you? They keep them in a the hole. I said, you mean to tell me you're going to keep me in the hole for another 90 days? He says, well... They'll be down to see you. That was two weeks. Then I finally, somebody came down to, to see me. It was the unit manager. So actually the classification and tell me what's really happening with me. So he says, uh, Mr. Rogers, you're going to be here for another 90 days. They're still doing the investigation. So that investigation lasted for a year. So after the year, I was in Lexington, Kentucky, and my family started worrying, started writing letters and getting my mail now. So I finally got some of my property. So I actually started writing to my family, letting them know what was going on, the proper in treatment of the Bureau of Prisons putting me in segregation because I brought these allegations against the God, a prison God, which they were true. You know, I live with that every day. So after the, about a year, I was let out general population. I actually met a lady there. She was in charge of hospice. She said, um, you know, I know this may sound kind of funny to you, but um, I've been looking at your institutional record. You know, you haven't been in any fights. You know, you're not one a troublemaker, but they have this stigma on you because of that assault. She says, uh, you know, I can't jeopardize my job, but I'm willing to let you work with hospice. So I took the program. I took the program for six months. And I was actually sitting with inmates that were terminally ill, had cancer, hepatitis, AIDS. That gave me something to look forward to, you know, after all that I had went through being in segregation. So I took the program, I graduated, and I started caring for other inmates that were terminally ill, watching their bodies deteriorate. The last individual that I sat with was 27 years old. The same staff member that gave me that position to actually work in hospice 
she came to me. She said, um, Mr. Rogers, she said, um, you're getting too close to the inmates. I said, well, you know, you asked me to do this. This is, this is voluntarily. I'm not getting paid. And I wasn't looking for any money anyways. But I put myself in somebody else's shoes, you know, to sit there day in and day out and sit four hours with one individual, another four hours with another individual. So my grandfather, he said to me, he said, Douglas, he said, I got a question for you. He said, you know, why would you complain? And he said, these people are never, they're not going to live. So I took an attitude of gratitude, you know, to sit there and watch somebody die, you know, to have some compassion, to rub their hands, you know, spend, spend that quality time with them. It gave me inspiration. So, after that, I, two months later, they said I couldn't work in hospice. It was a separate unit off from the compound. You know, the prison guards let you in. But uh, the staff member told me, she said, Douglas, I, I need you to give back your badge. And right there, it kind of ripped a piece of me out because, you know, the last person I sat with was 27 years old, and I'll never forget that. So I took the initiative to do suicide watch. I said, you know, they're not going to kill my spirit. It's going to make me stronger. So I, I did suicide prevention for about a year. I did that. I sat with individuals that gave up hope you know, to actually want to hurt themselves. You know. So each day I would, you know, bring them their food because the officer, he was too busy sitting at his desk. You know, he didn't care if they ate or not. He's looking at it as a paycheck because he comes in, he goes home. We stay there. We're inmates. Nobody's going to believe anything that we say. So I did suicide prevention for about a year. And I watched individuals want to take their life. But there was a sense of giving hope to somebody. You know? So about two, about two months after that, they called me to R&D and told me to pack my stuff because I was leaving that compound. I was only on that compound for about 10 months. 10 months. They moved me from Lexington, Kentucky to Pennsylvania. You know? But that didn't stop me from there. I said, what am I going to do now? So I ended up on a, on a compound, McKean, Pennsylvania. I took a a drug course. I took 500 hour drug treatment program. Uh, I worked with the psychology department. They were very helpful to me because they seen something in me. And I started a, a support group, NAAA, to help inmates that were leaving that were dealing with drug addiction. And I know that right now here in the state of Massachusetts and around the country, the opiate epidemic is very high. Um, I actually been in contact with certain individuals that I've been supporting. I got um, an individual that, that I, I support each and every day. He calls me. He was a straight alcoholic. He gave up drinking four years ago. I met him. He gave up drinking. He took the bottle and smashed it on the ground. It was something that, you know, he said to me, and he's still, he's into my church. He said, something about you, God sent you for a reason. He quit cold drinking. 
He's working. He's got a full-time job. And he's actually looking every day to call me. There's not a day that he doesn't call me. So, you know, certain things that you can affect people's lives. But as I was still doing my sentence, I went to Devons, Massachusetts, and I met Jason Lydon. And he was a good and dear friend to me because they tried to, in prison, will put a, a black or white inmate together to see if you would attack them or they would attack you, vice versa. But it wasn't the case because I don't look at race, creed, or color. I love people for who they are because that's the way I was raised. I don't look at color. So I um, took up dialysis care treatment. I sat with individuals because I was at, I, my security level had dropped. And I was at Devon's camp. It's a camp in Air, Massachusetts. But it's still a, it's a bureau of prison. I took the dialysis course there, and I was going inside the main prison besides being outside of the camp because you have more freedom. You're actually to lower security. I was there for a number of years, about three years. I met Jason. And he said, Douglas, they put me in here with you. I said, Jason, you're fine. So that's one of my dear friends. So we came together, and we started Black and Pink, which we're here today. That's who I represent, formerly incarcerated individuals, LGBTQ. That's us. That's me. That's what I do. That's a support system that I strive to help people, people that are actually going to the Coolidge House here in Boston on Huntington Avenue, across the street from the YMCA. My campaign is to stop the solitary confinement, to tear down these walls of these prison industrial systems that is overpopulated with individuals. Here in the state of Massachusetts, the DOC, can place an individual in solitary confinement up to 10 years. 10 years. Imagine someone for 10 years being held in solitary confinement. You know, they'll let them out after five, but they'll put them right back after to do another five. What do you do to a human being, their mind? You dehumanize a human being. So then when they come out from incarceration, where are they going to go? Where are, what are their skills or training that they have learned? You know, you have a lot of individuals that you see roaming around here in Boston, Rhode Island, that they're wandering. You know, I know some people get a little upset because they act change, you know, certain things of that nature, and then, you know, you got outbursts from these individuals. But there needs to be more focus on mentally ill people. People don't look at it in that aspect. They feel that, you know, they committed a crime, lock them up. I don't believe in locking up an individual and putting them in incarceration for a number of years. You know, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be better treatment for people. Because we all make mistakes, but you know what? We're still a human being. We, de we deserve the dignity to be treated like a human being. So. That brings me back to black and pink. We write to individuals that are incarcerated behind these walls. 
because they are locked away. Some of their family have turned their back on them. And then some people may say, well, what did they do to their family? You know, maybe the family member gets tired of that collect phone call, you know, don't want to go up to the prison, don't want to be degraded, going through the metal detector, you know, take everything out your pocket. You know, they do do that. And I understand that certain people may feel that I'm not a criminal. Why are you treating me like one? Because I heard it. But, you know, I believe that the prison walls and the solitary confinement is inhumane. No human being needs to be treated like that. You know, I understand that society says, you know, they're criminals. They need to be locked away. But they don't deserve to be treated less than a human being. My hope is with the campaign that we run that we can make changes. You know, we, we actually campaigned. We went to the state house. And let me, sorry. that's me and one of the prison cells to end solitary confinement. That is one of the cells that you know, they will place you in. It's, it's about five by eight cell, you got a toilet, but you gotta also remember, there's somebody else that's bunking in that cell with you, you know? You're not only in that cell by yourself. Some of these prison cells, like at South Bay, they're double bunked. So you have another, another man over you. And, and also in, Boston and Massachusetts, they lock up women too. They have women locked up that are pregnant, you know, so they take them to the hospital after they have their baby, they take their baby. The state takes their baby. Don't give them the chance to actually call a family member up. They just take the baby. You know, you're ripping the mother away from the child. So that's another thing that society doesn't know that's happening right here in Massachusetts, you know. That is one of the campaigns that uh, I'm dedicated to, to end solitary confinement. Uh, we, I marched to the State House. We brought over 3,000 signatures to end the solitary confinement that is being held, people are being held in the DOC up to 10 years. So that's my passion and that's my goal, you know, to end the solitary confinement with black and pink. I would love for you, you ladies and gentlemen, to take the time grab one of the brochures and actually like for you to be a pen pal to someone, you know? Help somebody, support somebody. You know, it's, it's only a stamp, but you could ch make a difference, change somebody's life, let them know that they're not alone. We're not asking you to send money, just a letter. Just to let them know that, hey, I'm here. I'm one of the persons that is supporting you, to help you, you know? Because when you're <coughs> depressed, suicidal, you know, a little smile goes a long way. Goes a long way. So that is my campaign. And I would like for you to look over. Oh, let me go back here. <laughs> yes.
little difficulty for a minute. <laughs> Here's some of the letters that I These are some of the letters that are uh, cards that I actually wrote to my mom at times. This was in 2011. I've been home seven years, out from the Barrow Prison. This was six months before I came home. Happy New Year's. And this is the commissary list in Lexington. If you're out in population, you can actually purchase some of these items from the commissary. I didn't have that because I was in the shoe, the hole, as they call it. But here's the commissary list that you're allowed to purchase these items from the commissary. The only thing I could buy off the commissary was stamps and letters, I mean, excuse me, envelopes to write. Couldn't have a pen, I had to use a pencil to write. Just these little simple things that people take for granted means a lot to somebody. So there I am, my campaign, ending solitary confinement around the country. I am more focused now on helping individuals, mainly the LGBT community here, because we're being attacked so much by society, by our president, Donald Trump. Hasn't given us any open invitation to the White House. But we're gonna continue fighting, not giving up. So that's my presentation to you today, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you for your time. much, Douglas. <clears throat> that was a really moving story. Um, so we're going to have about 15 minutes to take questions. Um, raise your hand and I can come bring you the microphone. Thank you for sharing your story, Douglas. Um, how many chapters of Black and Pink are there around the country? We have, I believe it's 30, Chicago, yeah, uh, Nebraska, we're getting ready, Seattle, Chica Chicago, New York, Providence, Ohio, Ohio. and Syracuse, I think so, yeah, I believe it's like maybe nine or 10. But our main, where we grassrooted is here in the state of Massachusetts. It's, um, you know, our hub is here, but we're actually, we have a, a interim, new national interim director that is actually coming here. But our office is gonna be moved to Nebraska 
Um, at this point in time, I'm not financially stable to make that to Nebraska, because I would. But God got me planted here for a reason. And, you know, sometimes when I, I notice certain people may not be religious, you know, I am a very person because of a very rooted Christian family. My grandmother was 98 when she died. She was the mother of the church. So each and every day, I even got my Facebook page. I try to reach out to somebody, just a word of encouragement. And you may not think it's nothing, but you never know what someone else is going through, you know. And I can just sense the feeling of those 17 young children that lost their lives. You know, that, that hurts. And I'm just asking each and every one of us to keep people in prayer. Prayer does change things. There's, you never know what somebody's going through. Never know. You never know. Just wanted to thank you for sharing your story. It was really powerful, and for your resilience in trying to change the system to help other people. Um, do you know of other states where these efforts are, you know, maybe further along, or are we further along than other states? I know that it probably has to be changed state by state because yes, every it does. state um, has. Basically, about. here in um, well, I'm from Providence, but I'm rooted here. We have went to the state house and went and marched for different things to change at the ACI. Um, there's individuals that are being held in high, it's called high security, and basically they put you over there and you never heard from. And you gotta think, if you lock somebody up for 10 years in solitary confinement, what are they gonna do when they come out here? How are they gonna adjust to society? You know, that's the key word, society, because we all wanna live in society, but we wanna be safe. We wanna be, you know, we wanna feel free because we are Americans, we're supposed to be free. And, you know, for your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, to be happy, to walk with you, don't have no fear, you know? You're welcome. Hi, Douglas. Hi, um, how you doing today? I'm good, thank you. My name is Trina, and um, I do have a question, but I first wanted to say that I'm, I was born in Louisville, Kentucky, and I spent a fair amount of time in Lexington when I was in school. So okay. just hearing you tell that story takes me back to what it was like, you know, especially for people of color in yes. Lexington, Kentucky. And so I just wanted to lift that up. But my question for you is about the experiences of LGBTQ people of color mm -hmm. who are incarcerated. And I'm particularly interested in black folk who are LGBTQ, mm -hmm. and I appreciate you telling the story around, you know, racism and race relations mm -hmm. within the system, but I'm also interested in what are the experiences of queer people of color who are incarcerated, and thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll answer your question for you. They are the most mistreated individuals in the BOP and the DOC. They're the ones that they try to remove from population. Um, I have a, a letter in my pocket right now. Mm. No, it's upstairs. Well, I should have brought it down. I got a letter from an individual. Uh, I've been 
writing back and forth for a number of two years. Uh, they were scheduled to be released just last week, and they were denied parole. Um, the next six months to a year, they can go back up for parole, but they never gave a reason why they were denied parole. Their excuse was they didn't have, well, yeah, excuse me, they had a excuse that the address that they used when they sent the paperwork out, it came back uh, address unknown. And the individual, that's their grandmother's house and their mother's house. It's a triple decker right here in Boston, Massachusetts and Dorchester. So there's something wrong with the paperwork right there and that's a mis treatment of an individual because they're LGBTQ and that's not right. So right now I am I supposed to get a phone call tomorrow from legal services. They're working on the campaign with me to actually free this individual. My my work doesn't stop. And I have dedicated my life to helping people, and that's what I do. You know, my mom, she was a foster grandparent for 35 years in the state of Mass uh, state of Rhode Island. Uh, I have a sister right now. She's a probation parole officer. So, you know, I come from a family that they're very highly educated, just like most of you people in here, and we try to help people, you know. And like I said, with black and pink, that's my dedication for me that strives, motivates me. I'm not a lazy person. <laughs> you know, they may made a little difficulty for me, you know, where four or five o'clock in the morning I'm wide awake because of the, the trauma of being held in segregation and lights being left on for n all night, you know. So, you know, them are some of the mistreatments that, you know. But we'll get through it. Anyone else have any questions? Thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen.